Aoife, good evening. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me, Josh. Yes, I, I've been looking forward to uh, uh, getting you on. You know, it's been a good while since we um, had a chance uh, to chat. Uh, you know, you and I, we studied at the same university, the University of York. And gosh, when was that? Like, we graduated back in like, what, 2017? Something like that? Six years ago yeah, now? Yeah, 2017. It feels like a lifetime ago, really. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. So did you, which course did you do? Did you do bioarchaeology or did you just take some of the, the modules that I was on? I, I think I was just in some of the modules that you took part yeah. in. Um, I was actually part of the field archaeology. That's what I uh, thought. Program. Yeah. But I think we might've been the smallest program, um, at the department. I, I would say, I think there was only like seven of us. And I think you were part of the, uh, cultural heritage management. Is that correct? I was bioarchaeology. Oh, okay. Um, I was bioarchaeology. So I think there was about 15 of us. So there was quite a few. Um, but yeah, like, because we, we mixed with a, people from all different um, courses. Um, so Michal, my husband, did Mesolithic studies. And there was only a couple in his year. But he did some modules that I did as well. So it was, um, yeah, it was nice to intermingle with everyone and see people from different aspects of archaeology. I guess. Yeah, I, I think you and I, we might have done um, the archaeology of human bones uh, together. I think that yes, was the course name, yes. but so something around human bones, which is clearly well in your wheelhouse, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. I remember those osteology labs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, you know, like I said, I've been definitely looking forward to uh, getting you on here to catch up. And, and also, you kind of have like a very unique specialty, something that has briefly come up on the podcast, but not to the point where I've done an entire episode on it. So this is going to be um, a very interesting uh, conversation. Now, I was kind of thinking like how I would introduce you um, because of what it is that you specialize in. I guess the best way I can kind of describe you for the sake of this episode would be a uh, death scholar, I suppose. Um, but yeah, what, what, what yeah. do you think? Is that fitting? <laughs> no, it definitely is fitting. Definitely. Um because I, like you just mentioned, I did um, human bone modules, osteology background um, when I did bioarchaeology when I was in York. And then after that, I worked in a lab for a while, but I was becoming more and more interested in human remains. Um, so I eventually pursued a PhD. Um, I had my Viva three weeks ago, which I passed, thankfully. Nice. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So I looked at 19th century anatomical specimens in medical museums. Um, so I looked at their preservation, how they're displayed to the public, what the attitudes of the public are towards them, and um, also how they're professionally dealt with. So it was a, quite a large umbrella um, looking at these human remains. And with that, PhD, I did a lot on 19th century death in general, death practices and how important death was um, to the individuals, rich and poor back then. And I was approached to become a trustee of Undercliff Cemetery in Bradford back in 2022, I believe. I had visited the cemetery a few times and was posting images on social media. And one of the trustees reached out to me and asked me if I would like to come on board. And I said I would. So I've been a trustee there for two years. And I, the cemetery registrar and business manager position came up. So I applied for that and got it. Um, I had a good extensive background in death research in project management from working on my PhD and from working on a few death related projects um, through my PhD as well. Um, as a research assistant. Um, so I just, I think I was a really good fit for it. And yes, yeah, so now I'm a cemetery registrar, or as I like to call myself, a graveyard keeper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did remember seeing some of uh, the, you, you posted a couple of reels and some photos of uh, Undercliff Cemetery, like uh, on your uh, social media. And I'm like, um, man, a cemetery registrar. It's like, um, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot to keep you busy, like as it comes up. But uh, that also sounds kind of 
eerily peaceful at the same time, I, I, I would suppose, because, um, well, for one, it's just, you know, cemeteries are just quiet uh, in general. Like even the living that come to the cemetery are usually quiet out of uh, respect. So, I mean, there's something that sounds kind of uh, peaceful, a uh, uh, job, I, I would say, overall. It is. It's really, it's, it's a lovely place. It's really, really beautiful. We have such stunning monuments and you do get a lot of people who just come to visit for the history, but you also get people who come to visit who are interested in death or, you know, spooky things. And um, you just, you, because we're also a working cemetery still, we also get people who are visiting their loved ones in certain sections as well. Um, and we have people who are tracing ancestors. Uh, for instance, I had a lady who came all the way from Virginia uh, two weeks ago, and she had traced an ancestor to Bradford. And um, there was oh, a lot wow. of immigration. Yeah, there was a lot of immigration to and from Bradford in the 19th century. Um, so that was really interesting. You get people from all sorts of backgrounds. We get students who come as well, who um, go on tours around the cemetery and learn about the history. Um, and like I said, we get other groups too. So we get people who are interested in wildlife. We get people who are interested. For instance, we had a bat walk actually, which was really, really popular. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, because we have a few bat boxes around the cemetery. So that was uh, really, really interesting. And yeah, it's, it's a really great place. And it's really, really active, you know, considering it's a place where people are laid to rest. It's still a really, really active place, which is great. You know, it's a, it is a cemetery charity. You know, we we rely on people coming and getting the word out there about the cemetery and the fact that it is really, really beautiful and historical, but also that it is actually a working cemetery too. People can still buy a plot at the cemetery as well, which is um, quite an incredible spot to be. So how long has uh, Undercliff uh, been in operation? Um, you know, because I'm actually kind of curious uh, when you have some people that are trying to trace their ancestry and they find their way to the cemetery, like how far back uh, are they uh, looking on some of uh, their ancestors? So the cemetery first opened for burials in the 1850s. Mm. So it's 150 years old. Um, it was opened initially because they were running out of space Um in the city, the churchyards are just becoming full. And this was quite a common theme that happened in the 19th century in Britain. Um, churchyards were becoming full. They're becoming overflowed. Um, it was causing sanitation issues. Um, there just was not enough room, basically, especially when there was an explosion of population. So um, cemeteries were opened to tackle that problem. Um, Undercliff was opened and it was um, open to all denominations. So they had a consecrated side of the cemetery and an unconsecrated side of the cemetery, which we still have today. Um, so we have people who are Church of England. We also have um, people who are Catholic, Jewish. All denominations are in the cemetery. And it went through different periods. So it was owned by the cemetery company it was originally ran by. And then eventually it was um, taken over privately. Um, it did go into quite a lot of disrepair in the 70s. Um, there was a lot of vandalism and that sort of thing. It wasn't really being looking at, looked after. And then the um, Friends of the Cemetery then was established to try and bring it back to life. Um, it was then bought by the local council and is run by the charity today. So it's gone through different periods in time. And we have people from all walks of life in the cemetery we have people who were extremely poor who will be buried in company graves that they're called or pauper graves which will have multiple burials in and it was a cheaper way to bury your loved one um, you wouldn't have a headstone you wouldn't have their name on a headstone or anything because obviously that will come at an extra cost and then we also have wool barons from the 19th century who were extremely rich who have these really really large stone monuments that are just works of art really um, and we have loads and loads of uh, examples of funerary art as well within the cemetery we have uh, quite common in the 19th century you would have had draped urns you would have had um, obelisks um, there was quite a lot of egyptomania in the 19th century so you can see the inspiration from that so we basically have people from all walks of life, from all different backgrounds and from all periods in time dating from the 1850s. Right on. That's amazing. Now, I kind of want to get a little bit of background um, about you and 
I guess your your interest and what kind of sort of uh, sparked this uh, um, fascination uh, for you, ultimately, of course, to the point and uh, into the position that you are now. So could you take us back here a little bit and just kind of tell us like what sort of set you down this path? Like what was it about death, human remains and everything like that that stood out to you to make you want to pursue it? Yeah, I get asked this question a lot because people are like, "What you work in? You're a graveyard keeper, you know? Like it's it's quite an unusual job." I said, "Yeah, I mean it is, but it's well suited for me." But um, <laughs> to be honest, Josh, I think my background has a lot to do with my um, Irish Catholic upbringing. I think my interests really stemmed from that. Um, growing up in rural Ireland, we were always very open about talking about death and dying. We have a tradition as well back in Catholic Ireland, uh, in rural Ireland, where we bring the loved one home to the house for a couple of days to wake after they've died. So they're displayed in the home, um, which sounds very Victorian, but it still is actually um, going on today. So we have the loved one at home and I had seen loved ones who had died from a very young age. So I became quite comfortable and quite interested in death. And as well as that, I grew up on quite a historical uh, peninsula down in Wexford. We have the oldest operational lighthouse in the world there, uh, which oh, is wow. where I had my first job, which was pretty cool. That is pretty um, cool. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I used to do give tours up and down this lighthouse, um, the Hook Lighthouse, it's called. It's a really incredible place. And also the peninsula as well is where the Normans landed um there was there was just so much history in the area and history that was tangible i mean you could see it in the monuments that had been left so i think it was a mixture of you know getting interested in archaeology and history and then being really open to death and dying as well coming from background from that background i also had like quite a lot of bereavement as well over the years um, I lost both parents uh, who were quite young when they died and I had other family members who had died. So I think I was just interested in the grieving process as a whole, but also interested in history as well. And then when I did bioarchaeology, uh, when I was in York, I just kind of wanted to learn more and more, really. Um, and I started working in a biochemistry lab teaching um, a teaching technician after I did my master's. And I, I I liked it, but I knew I, st I wanted to do something more death based. And I actually intended to start training as an embalmer. Um, so I started to do some embalming training um, with a local funeral director um, with the intention of uh, getting accredited. But then COVID hit. So that went completely out the window. You couldn't go anywhere near a funeral home or interact with the dead um, on any level because we just didn't really know how COVID was spreading um, and how dangerous it was and whether we could, you know, interact with each other, interact with the deceased, interact with their loved ones. So that was put on the back burner, really. But I was still really interested in uh, preservation, fluid preservation, which is what really got me on to um, the museum specimens themselves, because the ones that I specifically focused on are preserved in fluids. So they date back to around the 18th century. And that's when fluid preservation was really um, taking off in Britain. So it would have initially been alcohol, spirit of wine. And then later on in the later half of the 19th century, eventually they would have started using formaldehyde, which is what is used in funerary embalming today. Um, so I guess kind of a very long winded way of saying I was interested in history. I was interested in death. And then I was eventually interested in fluid preservation um and the funerary practices and then when i became a trustee of the cemetery um i just really fell in love with the place i thought it was amazing it had such a huge victorian historical background um it had people who were um interacting due to contemporary death as well so it felt like it was the whole package for me when this job came up so i was really excited to apply for it, it it's interesting when you bring up uh fluid uh preservation because um that's like I think uh, the scene that a lot of people see in like, in like horror films, right? Where you know you're yeah. going you're going through like <laughs> Frankenstein's lab and you see all the clear glass yes. jars with uh, with like body parts or organs or something like that. And yep. um, now it kind of makes me think it's just 
What was the trial and error that looked like for people who initially tried to preserve these things uh, in fluid? It's like, oh, water doesn't work. Um, this doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> okay, finally, we got alcohol. Now that works. <laughs> so that, yes. that's, that's, that's kind of a, it's like when I, I can't help but think about that. It's just, you know, how the scientific method and trial and error, you know, have, must have applied to like death studies along the way too. Yeah, and I mean, it still was ongoing and it still is an ongoing trial and error with these things. You know, um, some fluid isn't as stable as others. Some jars are not as stable as others. For instance, um, they transferred from glass jars to perspex jars in the 60s and they leak a lot more than the glass ones. So they're trying to help with that now. And initially they would have used stuff like brandy, um, to preserve and, that, and um, they would have also used vinegars um, they would have also used like salts um, so again it really was a trial and error base and as we have moved in time and there has been an introduction of uh, better formulas it obviously has improved but it, it's an ongoing learning process I was lucky enough to do a course um, last year um, with a fluid preserver and um, he was just showing tips and tricks and how to um, deal with things that are leaking. And a lot of the time as well, you don't actually know what these specimens have been preserved in, especially if you don't have archival information attached to them. It may have been lost in history. So that's something as well you have to tackle and grasp. You don't know what you're you're getting yourself into when you open these jars either, which again does add sort of a, um, a horror element to it. <laughs> Now, how did you kind of feel when you started uh, working with human remains uh, for the first time? Like with me personally, I'm kind of sort of mixed when it comes to human re remains. Mm. Not that I'm like squeamish to work with them, but the biggest thing mm. for me is just obviously for, you know, the ethics of it, you know, just making sure that I'm being respectful and, you know, handling them with care and respect. Um, so how, do, how did you kind of feel once you've kind of um, like started uh, working with human remains uh, for the first time? Yeah, it's exactly that. It's being ethical and being respectful to what you're handling. And this is something that we see a lot, you know, with students who might handle osteological specimens for the first time. You know, bones are very robust. They're a lot more robust than um, fluid specimens. So you have to kind of say, please be careful. Don't, you know, drop them or slam them on the table and just remember that you're handling someone that is and was an individual and it was someone who was living. And when I first started working, um, when I first started doing the, some of the training in the funeral home as well, that was actually a big leap from an archaeologist because I was so used to handling osteological remains. And then to see someone who was recently deceased, it was very different. But again, I think because I grew up in a culture that was very open about seeing the dead body, I think that prepared me somewhat. Um, so I, I didn't find it upsetting, really. I just found it, um, I suppose I found it to be um, quite intense, um, but something I could handle. And also I was really hyper aware of the fact that this was somebody's loved one that I was taking care of. So you really want to do the best job that you possibly could as well, especially when it comes to embalming process and caring for the dead person. And also as well, then when I was handling the specimens, that was a completely different element altogether because I wasn't handling old osteological remains that are, you know, hundreds and hundreds or thousands of years old, but I wasn't handling contemporary dead. I was handling almost an in-between um, because they were preserved, but they were 19th century and they also had a uh, soft tissue attached Whereas a lot of archaeological remains from the 19th century don't have any soft tissue attached, depending mm -hmm. on how they were preserved or right. if they were in a lead-lined coffin or anything like that. Usually as an archaeologist, we're handling skeletal remains, but I was sidestepping then into contemporary dead and then into these other tissue type again. And that was another sort of way to think about handling human remains because I was like, yes, it's human remains, but it's not a whole person um, it's a section of a person um, and there's this really hazardous fluid that is there too. So you're being mindful of that as well. And also you, what came up quite a lot ethically with these uh, human remains was that a lot of them were likely taken uh, without consent. 
So they were likely taken from body snatching contexts um, or they were taken from autopsies or operations, likely without permission from the individual or their families. And that's just how things were back then. Um, it was legal. It, it doesn't necessarily mean it was ethical, but there was um, quite a different way of doing things in the medical profession back then. And that was something I was really aware of as well when I was handling these remains. I am. Um, I was like, yes, they were. They were probably created under a standard that wouldn't hold up today. But I'm going to handle them with a high standard that is acceptable in contemporary settings. So that was another thing that I had to juggle as well when I was um, handling them. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point because obviously, when you're uh, working with skeletal remains, I mean, the main difference there is the passage of time. You know, it's like mm. the, the it's now to the point where it's just it's only the bones uh, that remain, which, as you mentioned, is drastically different if you're working with, let's say, like maybe a cadaver or or something like that. Mm. That's a little bit more of a recent uh, passing, but obviously, the common denominator between the two is that they're still both people. And I think yeah. as long as you keep that in the forefront of your mind, then that just reminds you just to can't ha handle it um, ethically. Because there's been some, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's like some scandals uh, here in the States where there's been some osteoarchaeologists who are like posting photos on social media, you know, they're posing mm -hmm. with like human skulls in their labs and stuff like that. And, uh, and it's like, nope what made you think that that was okay to do that? So, um, so there, there's definitely, um, you know, you gotta be careful, uh, o mm. o overall there's, I mean, not only just, so you're handling with care for preservation sake, but just out of respect just as well too. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is to do with intent and context as well. I mean, you, there is some people who share some photos online of human remains, but I think you have to do it in a way that's educational and respectful like you're not posing in a strange position with a skull or a femur or you know i think it, like the actual intent that you have and what you're trying to um, portray out into the world is really important and to think about people might stumble across an image that they might not necessarily want to see either so you have to think of that too and it's it is a minefield and i don't know if there is an answer a straightforward answer really and i think it depends on where you're from as well and what your background is what you might find more acceptable and um, somebody else might not find acceptable so that's something you have to keep in mind as well and to try and find that balance and i don't think you're going to please everyone but as long as you're doing things with a good intent and um respectful um then i think that's all you can do really is just to um to really think about what you're doing and what you're putting out there yeah, kind of speaking of uh, death and culture um, a little bit, you know, you 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 kind of fascinated me when you talked about your uh, Irish Catholic upbringing, where you know typically um, after a loved one had passed, they were brought home for a few days uh, for you know an open wake and everything like that. You know, there, there's a lot of cultures out there that have very very fascinating uh, thoughts and practices around uh, death too. Like even myself uh, in the military. You know, a lot of my fellow Marines, like uh, a lot of their tattoos would be of like very morbid imagery, like, uh, you know, skulls and or like the Grim Reaper or s something along those lines, too, just because, you know, death was kind of sort of a constant companion on the battlefield, obviously. And then um, I, I wanted to share this uh, interesting um, thing with you uh, as well. You might appreciate this. Uh, when I was in West Africa, gosh, about 10 years ago, I was in the Gambia in, um, there and um so some some Gambian women, not all necessarily, I think, believe this, but if you went up to some Gambian women and and if they had like a little baby with them, and if you said that their baby was like cute or beautiful or something like that, they would actually get upset with you because um, if you say that the baby is beautiful, like they believe that death is like an actual entity that is lurking around oh, them like okay. all the time, like kind of like, I guess, a grim reaper, I, I suppose. And if death hears you uh, say that the baby is beautiful, he may become curious and want to come and uh, take a look. And if he likes the baby, then he'll take the baby kind of sort of. Oh, okay. Um, so, so if you... um. But if you were to say that, oh, oh, what an ugly baby or something like that, like try saying that like anywhere here in the States or in the UK, oh, what an ugly, disgusting baby you have there. <laughs> but they, but a, lo a lot of them would laugh and would like laugh it up with you because they're kind of thinking that, well, if you say the baby's ugly, then death wouldn't want to look, death would want to just go yeah. somewhere else. So um, 
So I guess, so my question from that would be, is just, um, has there been any sort of like death perceptions um, or I guess like cultural practices around death um, with like cultures around the world that maybe kind of have stood out to you that maybe particularly fascinated you? I mean, there's so many, really, there, there's so many and even cultural differences. Like I even find like living in the UK now, coming from Ireland, I even find that there's a huge difference. I mean, I've talked to people who are my age, you know, in their 30s, and they said they've never seen a dead body. And I'm like, oh, my God, you've never seen a dead body. I've seen so many from when I was younger and going to wakes and that sort of thing. And they think that's really strange, you know, which is which is really, really um, interesting. And um, I also noticed that there is actually um, Ireland are quite big on embalming. Um, and I think believe they are in the States as well. Um, and that's something I found quite interesting. There's those parallels there um, with the open coffin side of things. I always find that to be quite interesting. But to be honest, I mean, I'm being very biased, but Irish culture in general around death really, really interests me, um, especially now that we're coming up to Halloween and Samhain. Um, so growing up, Halloween was a huge part of our community and it was a huge part of um, being a child, really, in, in rural Ireland, being in school. Um, and what I really find interesting around the world and not just in Ireland is um, death omens themselves. So an omen that death is coming or, you know, if you see if you see a, a crow or if you see a raven or you know, this, that, and the other thing. But in Ireland, we kind of like go really, really hard with, with those death omens. And one of the really, really famous ones is the Banshee. I don't know if you've heard of the Banshee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Have. So if, yeah. So if you hear her scream or your loved one hears her scream, then, um, someone in your family is, is, um, thought to die. And, um, there's a lot of lore around her who she's always a woman. Um, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of lore around her um, suggesting that maybe she was a keener um, in life and a keener for anyone who doesn't know is somebody who um, does do performative mourning at funerals. And this has gone all the way back to ancient times, keening. Um, and it was very, very prevalent in Irish society as well, the keen. Um, and there was a group of women called the Queenig and they would um, perform the keen at funerals. Um, and that went on into the 19th, 20th century as well. But there's thoughts that maybe she was a keener um, before she died. And then she is carrying on that role in death. There's also some suggestions that um, if you didn't do the keen properly in life, then you would end up like a banshee in death, uh, said to carry on that legacy. Um, she's also said to have this really long either gray or flaxy or red hair it depends on um what source you're looking at she's also said to be a maiden or a crone she can be either um and she kind of reminds me of a siren as well she has that sort of alluring quality about her um and uh, she said to comb that hair and if you see a comb somewhere then don't touch it because that could be the banshee's comb and she'll come looking for it um we also have the knocks on the door. If you hear three knocks on the door, then death is is going to come. And um, we also, if you see certain lights at night time, then death is going to come. There's another one um, called the death coach as well, which is somewhat linked to the Banshee, but it actually kind of reminds me of Sleepy Hollow as well. And there's some suggestion that um, Washington Irving had heard um, the death coach um, tales when he was uh, visiting Europe. And um, so basically the death coach is um, driven by a, well, they say a fairy called the um, Gon, Gon Keown, which means without head. So a headless horseman would be associated with the death coach. And the Banshee is also associated with the death coach as well. And they would drive into small towns and small places. And if you hear the hoofs of um, the coach, then death was going to come for you. And so, yeah, it's um, Ireland really go <laughs> hard when it comes to death they they're really interested in that side of things and i think a lot of that was probably to do with um how we handle um and how we are interacting with the dead body all the time so it's a way of trying to come to terms with the death and trying to come to terms with the grief that comes with that death and the bereavement so i think that was a really important aspect 
but I mean, all across the world, there's so many different and really, really interesting um, aspects relating to death. I particularly love um, the Ghanan fantasy coffins. I don't know if you've seen them in Ghana. Mm -mm, no. Um, basically, you can have a coffin made from uh, as anything, anything you want. So they have like really, really beautiful, like some of them are like airplanes or mobile phones or um, chilies, like anything, you name it, they can make it into a coffin. It's so amazing. And I worked on a couple of projects, uh, one called the Continue Bonds Project and one called the Dying to Talk Project, which is uh, run by uh, Professor Karina Croucher at University of Bradford. And what was done as part of those projects was to bring different ideas of death and dying from archaeology and then from around the world and get people talking about contemporary death and get people talking about their own bereavement and their own grief and making it a little bit easier and saying, well, you know, you can think about mourning jewellery from the Victorian period, um, but you can still get cremation rings made today and people still have the ashes of their loved ones. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's I think it's really, really important to talk about death all over the world and to talk about death in the past as well because it kind of shows you how we've gotten to this period in time for instance wearing black you know became in fashion when um around the time of queen victoria um after albert died so that's why we wear black um and why we have funeral flowers as well um they were you know set up in the funeral homes especially lilies so i think looking at how we've mourned in the past and how we do it now it's really interesting to see how we have gotten to that point really and why we do certain traditions they haven't just come out of nowhere there has been a, a huge history behind them and then to look as well around the world and say well they do that here you know so and not to think it's weird or strange but to just say like just because we do it doesn't mean it's considered normal elsewhere and like I said, like being in the UK, people think it's very odd that we brought our loved one home and had them in the living room for a day or two, where they would think that's that's completely, you know, off the scale to what they would consider normal. So, yeah, it's important to have these conversations and to be non-judgmental in how you're having them as well, because what's comforting to one person is not comforting to another, you know. Yeah, it, it's interesting how, how you bring that up about how some people in the UK kind of view death uh, that way a little bit. <clears throat> Not quite to the death, obviously, that you have uh, in Ireland. Uh, I actually, uh, when I had first moved there, um, a, I went with a friend to like this small town um, in the uh, in the Peak District, you know, because we were going hiking and everything like that. And we're going through this town and we actually go through a cemetery. And um, now, of course, like for me, like growing up in the States, uh, all the cemeteries that I have been to where some of my own loved ones were buried, you know, they were very uh, modern cemeteries, you know, uh, headstones were usually made out of like polished granite and everything mm. uh, like that. And then um, all the cemeteries uh, that I saw in the UK were kind of were again, if I go back to like, let's say, watching classic horror films like Dracula, like uh, the old cemeteries with the raw iron gates and yeah. the very, very old looking uh, stone headstones and the leafless skeleton trees. And then usually had like a small church like that went into the center and then like uh, the old uh, stone paths that went there too. And I'm like, <laughs> and I couldn't help but say to myself, oh man, this cemetery is creepy. And like, and, and she's like, it's just a cemetery, Josh. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, so I, <laughs> it's I mean, so out of the realm of normal for you to see something so. I, I suppose they're so gothic looking, aren't they? And yeah, you know, English Victorian funerary monuments are just on another level. They're amazing. Yeah, and so I kind of thought to myself, okay, the only thing we're missing now is a full moon and wolves howling in the distance. Yes, <laughs> so. <laughs> literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, I, I wanted to um, expand on something that you just mentioned about uh, the death coach, which that uh, um, part of your story just particularly fascinated me. Now, I'm assuming that um, in Irish lore, there, like the death coach didn't throw a flaming uh, pumpkin or anything like that. I'm, it sounds like I, I'm, I'm going to assume that Washington Irving took like kind of like creative license for that if, if he did, in fact, get inspiration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you did, in fact, this is the thing, they're not 100% sure. But um, apparently there is some, um, some say as well that the coach, um, the wheels can leave smoke. So there is some sort of fire element there as well. Um, and it's really interesting, apparently as well, um, 
Yeats wrote um, quite extensively on Irish lore and Irish culture. And I think he mentioned as well that the only way to get rid of um, the Gonkeon or the Dúlhan is what they also referred to was to uh, show him some gold. And then he was like, no, thanks. And um, so that was the way to get rid of them, which is, is really interesting as well, because that also thinks about the purity of metals and how iron as well is associated with spirits and how to, to like get rid of spirits, too. So I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, but yeah, like, but then again, there could, there's similar sort of tales in Europe as well. There's other similar tales um, that do overlap a little bit with Irish culture, too. We have... Um, the fetch as well which is basically a doppelganger so if mm. you see uh, someone who's a doppelganger or you see somebody there's a lot of um old tales that you can actually read online there's like um a, a repository with all these um folkloric tales that were taken from school children in ireland and um i think it's called duckus and online they have like some people saying that, oh, they saw somebody up in a field, but it, they thought it was that person. But then when they went past their house, they could see that they were standing on their porch and that person ended up dying um, the next day or something like that. So the whole doppelganger uh, fetch phenomenon um, became uh, quite a thing in Ireland, but I believe it was also a really big thing in Germany too. So it's interesting how those tales also travel. Like I said, with Washington Irving and Sleepy Hollow, it, it's interesting how tales can travel through a continent and across continents as well. Yeah. And another thing I also find interesting is that, you know, different cultures from different parts of the world who have never interacted uh, with each other before, how a lot of them kind of come to sort of believe uh, the same thing. Like so many mm. cultures around the world have like their own interpretation of things like vampires or lycanthropes or something like that. Or, yeah. or you also do see like some overlap with like some death practices as well. And, and that kind of um, segues into like what I wanted to talk to you about next is that, you know, a lot of like uh, death rituals, um, are done in preparation for, you know, the afterlife. Of course, you know, we see this, like, especially like in Egypt, where, you know, King mm -hmm. Tut was buried with thousands of artifacts and, you know, all stuff that could have been useful to him in the afterlife. And and then, of course, like you see, um, you know, terracotta warriors in China, you know, thinking, you know, you bring the yeah. whole army with you into the afterlife, uh, too. So um, what are, were some of the things that you've kind of uh, picked up as far as, like, uh, in the afterlife, um, you know, maybe throughout like your own studies, because I know it's pretty prevalent uh, there in the UK, especially, I believe like there is like some there's been surveys done um, in which uh, it come to turn out that a lot of uh, people in Britain that more of them believe in ghosts than they even believe in God. So there's definitely something to be said uh, there about like the belief in the afterlife and spirits and ghosts and, and things along those lines. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, this again is something that uh, stemmed quite a lot from the 18th and 19th century as well. You would have, um, and this was why anatomical collections were quite controversial, because if you are digging up someone's loved one, you're really disturbing them in the afterlife. You're disturbing that body and you're disturbing, you know, someone at rest. Um, and I mean, this is still a big thing now. Pe what when you would lay out the body at home, you would um, have people who would come and lay out the body and um, put them in a shroud um, and also just clean them and wash them. And also you would um, have somebody who was always watching, always sitting with the body as well. And another thing that came about was sin eating. You might have heard of sin eating when you were eating in the presence of the body as well. And that was some way going to help um, absorbing their sins that they had in life. So what what was interesting as well during that time is that you would have had religious belief and you would have had folkloric belief and they're quite intertwined. And it seems that they would be kind of at odds with each other, because when we think of folklore um, and those kind of tales, we often think of them as maybe being pagan or, you know, maybe not having a religious association. But the two of them are still um, they, they were side by side. A lot of and now in Ireland, we have to like putting black on the door and um, closing curtains in the house where somebody has died. And that would have stemmed from the 19th century as well. And then even, you know, things that people are buried with, um, you know, through time, you would have had the introduction of. Um, sorry, I just said my Internet was unstable. Um, you would I, got have you, the I got you back. Yeah, we're, we're OK. OK, 
Cool. Um, we would have had the introduction of mourning jewellery as well and people wearing um, jewellery and looking their best when they were put in the coffin as well. And that was so that they would look their best, um, you know, on Salvation Day, you know, when we were meant to rise and that sort of thing. Um, and as you say, I mean, burials and death practices are thousands of years old. Like you mentioned the ancient Egyptians who are really the poster boys for death practices in archaeology. Um, so, yeah, it's varied. It's widening. I'm always learning more about it. And I think it's going to change as well as we go through. Now we're getting cremations more and more. And ever since COVID as well, um, there has been a huge rise in cremations. And once you cremate someone, you don't have to bury them straight away. You can hold, you can keep the ashes with you for as long as you need to. And then you can um, do the burial whenever you want. Um, and again, when you're doing cremation as well, you're not necessarily putting anything in with those great goods. And you're going through a period which is much longer as well. Whereas with a burial, in Ireland is pretty quick. It's usually a couple of days. In Britain, it's usually about two to three weeks. But again, if you have cremation ashes, it could be months, even years before you decide to actually bury that loved one. And that can be hard, especially if you've got an urn with someone in your living room for months. Years. It's going to be it's a hard process to then bury that person as well when you've had them around for so long after their own death. Um, and I think as well, there's been a huge rise in the cost of living. The cost of living is so high now. Especially in the UK, there's a, really a, um, a crisis at the moment with the cost of living. So I think cremation is also an affordable option for people too. And again, they just don't have the pressure to have to, you know, do a burial or have to think about what they want to do straight away with the burial as well. And again, that's going to change again. I think in another few years, it might change again where cremations kind of ease off. Um, or people want to do ash scattering now. They don't want to have plots anymore. Um, so yeah, it's, it's varied and always, always changing and it's always changing as well in between, you know, when I go home to Ireland, I, I never have attended one cremation, um, uh, when I've been in Ireland, but they seem to be more or less the norm here in Britain. So that's interesting as well. And a lot of that is probably to do with high population as well and lack of space, because this is something that is going to become an issue in burial grounds as well, is that we have a lack of space. And um, I believe down in Highgate Cemetery in London now, they actually um, have implemented um, grave reuse policy uh, where they uh, lift and deepen. So they will um, reuse graves that are 75 or 100 years old because they're running out of space, basically. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Like, I didn't even think about that, just how like... Um current circumstances like within the world itself um or in a yeah. location can affect like death practices uh, as we've been mm -hmm. uh, talking about here you know i mean obviously with um you know cost of living or inflation or maybe you know your country could be in the midst of a uh, economic depression or something like that and uh you know it's just like the uh, well it's like we'd love to give you good burial grounds uh loved one but unfortunately <laughs> money's tight right now um yeah, yeah. But, but, but then also like i mean even if you go back a couple hundred years i mean when the black deck uh, uh the excuse me the black death uh, swept across europe i mean the body count the casualty rate was so high that you know they were running out of space so quickly so they actually had no, mm -hmm. like almost no other choice but to just like dig up uh graves that were already used just to you know add the the bodies uh in there because they were just they were running out of space so um yeah so, so i guess it's, it's it is kind of interesting how um you know sometimes you almost have to do death practices uh, out of necessity not necessarily yeah. you know just uh um because that's exactly what you want to do it's just necessary at the time it seems Definitely. And that's something that happened quite a lot with COVID. We had burials, you know, happening very quickly and people weren't able to react, um, interact with their loved ones, um, which is quite a huge part of death practices around the world and um, uh, can be a big part of the grieving process as well. So that was taken away from people for a long time, too. And even at the funeral itself, you had social distancing and that sort of thing. And that can really impact, um, you know, being comforted by those around you as well. So, yeah, it can be situational as well as cultural death practices. And like you say, with the plague, 
you know, they would have had mass burials, you know, it would have been very, there would have been no individualization either, you know, that was something as well, you know, it's, they would just would have been buried and, you know, it was kind of on to the next. And this was the same thing that happened as well during um, the influenza pandemic, the Spanish flu in um, 1918, they had mass casualties for that as well. Um, and again, death was all around and people were kind of leaving their loved ones to be picked up at the uh, from their house because there were so many deaths happening all the time and they couldn't go to the burials either because of isolation and interaction with the body as well. And again, that was due to a situation that was happening. It wasn't what they wanted or what they believed in or what they wanted to happen to their loved one, but they had no other choice but to follow those protocols. Um, yeah, and I think it's um, definitely something we have to be aware of in history as well, that just because somebody was buried a certain way, it doesn't mean that that was the norm at the time or it doesn't mean that, you know, they, that's what they wanted. It just could have been out of necessity, possibly. Absolutely. So kind of to bring things back uh, full circle here um, a little bit with your current role as the mm -hmm. um, cemetery registrar or would you say a graveyard keeper? Is that the your self-proclaimed title? I Jen? say or that, but I mean, a graveyard and a cemetery are, are different. You know, a graveyard is attached to a church or, mm. you know, but a cemetery is standalone. But I like to say graveyard gotcha. keeper because I think it, um, it sort of encompasses the role when you say that. When you say registrar, people aren't really sure what that actually means. But I think when you say keeper, I think people sort of get it then. They're like, oh, yeah, OK, I get it. <laughs> So um, speaking of which, um, you know, I'm kind of curious and I'm sure probably some of our audience is kind of curious to know this about, too, is just uh, can you kind of sort of take us uh, into the day in the life of a, of a graveyards uh, keeper? It's just, um, you know, if you kind of just want to tell us about maybe some of your usual tasks, um, you yeah. know, I mean, surely, I mean, obviously it's like any other job. Uh, some days are different than others, I'm sure. But um, can you kind of sort of maybe just take us into, let's say, a regular day um, uh, over there at Undercliff for you? Yeah, so my office is actually located on site, which is very cool. So I have a lodge office there. So um, I come in in the morning um, and I'll do the mundane things. I mean, check check emails, check phone voicemails and that sort of thing to see if there's any burials been requested and um, to see if there's been any request for memorials to be put up. Um, so stonemasons will get in contact as well and um, say they want to put up um, a headstone or a curb set and that sort of thing. Um, I'll also check the cemetery itself. I'll have a walk around just to make sure everything is okay. Unfortunately, we have to deal with some vandalism sometimes, which isn't ideal or antisocial behavior. That's so very unfortunate. It is. It's really annoying. But what can you do? You know, you just try to do your best. So I'll go around and I'll check. Um, just check the cemetery itself. Make sure everything's okay. Um, make sure. Um, you know, I sometimes I'll walk around as well if people are there, if they need a hand with anything, if they want me to find a particular grave for them. So I'll help them with that. But my role is basically so I will be the first point of call for funeral directors when they're organizing a funeral. So they would ring me and say, we have there's a family plot at Undercliff. We would like to do a burial now that somebody has passed away. Um, and we would like to do a burial on this day. And I'll say, that's fine. So then I would organize for the grave digger to come out um, on that day. Um, so I'll organize the grave digging. Um, I'll organize the time the funeral can come. And then I have to check the um, coffin plate um, on the coffin when it's removed from the hearse, just to make sure the name matches the paperwork. Um, and then I will do some more paperwork and I'll send off um, a registration of that death um, that has happened at Undercliff. Um, and then also there's also the selling of the plots themselves. So people will come and they'll say, um, oh, we want to get a, a plot for two or a plot for one. So I'll try and accommodate that. Um, and this could be like long before somebody has died. I mean, this could just be somebody, you know, preparing for that future as well. Um, and we also do cremation size plots as well. So we have um, like smaller plots for uh, cremation ashes. So that's something that uh, we uh, w that I would organize as well. And then also memorials that are going up and that sort of thing. So people would apply for certain memorials to be put up and so that that would go through me as well. Um, yeah, so basically anything to do with the burials, anything to do with the memorials, um, anything to do with the, the paperwork, uh, the paperwork, 
And then if somebody wants to uh, transfer the ownership of a current burial to themselves after somebody has died. So say if somebody's um, mum had died and the grave plot was in their name, but there was also room for another burial for, say, their dad, then I would transfer the ownership. Then we would sort that out so that somebody else can then go into that plot because you can't do it if it's still in their name. So legal things like that as well. But I also do quite a lot of um, historical searching as well for graves. So we have a database now um, we're working on at the moment on digitizing a lot of the grave books that we have dating back to the 19th century. So they're held in the local archives. So we're digitizing them. Um, and that way people can say, oh, look, I have an ancestor from this date. I just want to check if they're in the cemetery or I know they're in the cemetery, but I want to check what section and plot number they're in because I want to visit the grave um, and I want to, um, you know, track them down or I want to see if anybody else is buried in that plot with them. So that's something that I would do as well, which is uh, looking through the records, which is really, really interesting. And you come across so many different things when you're uh, going through. I mean, you could have graves that have three or four people in and then you could have graves with loads and loads of people in because it became a company grave or um, a pauper grave. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 a really um, it's a really holistic role. There's quite a lot to it. And a lot of it I have to do, you know, I'll have to do the business side of things as well. So, you know, processing payments and all that, all that kind of thing, uh, which isn't, you know, as much as what I think people think a graveyard keeper is. That I just kind of loiter around a graveyard with a lantern, you know, digging graves and that sort of thing. But a lot of it is, you know. Um, kind of managing things and um, organizing things and making sure things are done when they're meant to be done and making sure people can get to uh, plots that they need to get to, funeral directors uh, can get access and all that sort of thing. So yeah, it is a very, very holistic role and it, it's very enjoyable and you do learn a lot of skills from it because it is a lot of project management as well, I guess, behind it. Yeah, lots of moving parts is what it sounds like. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, what I'm kind of curious to ask you, you know, since um, we are still in uh, the month of Halloween, of course, I got to ask you about if you've had any spooky uh, occurrences, you know, because when it comes to cemeteries, like like when I was growing up, um, and I didn't actually do this, so I hope no one comes after me, but uh, jokingly, like me and some of my friends, like in school, we would be like, oh man, we should go to uh, the cemetery at night with a Ouija board and see if we can commune with the dead and all <laughs> that stuff. So, because I think there was just that idea that like, if you go to the cemetery at night, you're, you're like almost guaranteed to see a ghost, right? A lot of people yeah. kind of sort of, you yeah. know, uh, thought about that. But, um, and then of course, um, even now it's just like some cemeteries, like I know um, in New Orleans, uh, for instance, you know, there's a lot of like uh, ghost tours that operate within that city and the cemeteries are typically... Um, uh, within the city are like one of like the hot spots that you know make up a uh, part of the tours where people are led through so um have you by chance had any sort of uh, occurrences uh um at, at undercliff that might have uh potentially been paranormal uh, occurrences because another thing that's interesting about you being based in the uk is that um, especially now going into the fall in the winter time you know the sun's gonna set by 4 30 and you could mm. still be working by the time the sun sets so um has uh, by chance anything might have happened uh, well since you worked there it's funny you mention it because actually bradford is actually been they've done a poll recently i can't remember what it was for but bradford is considered one of the most haunted areas in britain really which i thought which i thought was really really interesting yeah apparently it's it's considered quite quite a haunted place and i will say i haven't been in this job very long but i will say that the cemetery itself has a feeling to it it almost feels like, and I know it's a really strange way to phrase it, considering it's full of the dead, but it does have a life of its own. It kind of has that sort of eeriness to it. And I don't know if you, you might have seen some of the, the images I put up on social media of what it's like in the fog, and it really takes your breath away mm -hmm. of how eerie and spooky and kind of yeah unsettling it can be but in a really beautiful way in a really stunning beautiful way and i don't know if i've seen anything that's 
really scary. My radio just turned on by itself quite a lot, which is um, kind of strange. And there's a lot of crackling behind that. So that can be quite um, off putting. But I don't know if I'm on edge because I'm at a cemetery. But everybody could be gone home for the day and the radio just turns on and starts talking or doing something you know which is kind of odd and really something that I didn't want to think about too much so I just turned that off and just sort of <laughs> kind of put it back in the corner I was like no thank you um and radios not just don't turn there. on by themselves Eva. <laughs> yeah yeah well and they just start kind of crackling and I was like no we're just not gonna I'm just gonna ignore that that's fine um <laughs> and even when you're walking around in the fog you know sometimes you're like did I see something did I not see something have I saw something, you know, like you're kind of always questioning yourself a little bit of whether you've seen something. You're like, oh, that could just be somebody walking a dog. But you don't know if it is because it's amongst the fog. So I wouldn't say I have anything super, super scary, disappointingly, because I am a bit of a I'm a big spooky fan, but I've only been here. I haven't been in the role that long. So I think as time goes by, more and more will appear, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all, 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 all in due time. I mean, you know, yeah. you know the, 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 the residents at the cemetery, you know, they're just getting to know you a little bit. Yeah, so. of course. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, oh, she's OK. We'll say hello eventually. But at the moment, we'll um, we'll just sort of leave her alone. But I will say I do have um, two crow friends that come every day and they sit up on the headstone and they're quite spooky. And there's a little black cat that comes in as well, who is quite spooky, too, which is just a sight to behold, really. It's just the ultimate graveyard experience really with these two crows sitting on the headstone and um, a little spooky black cat that comes in so that really adds to the atmosphere as well <laughs> yeah yeah good on them for like uh you know adding to the ambiance there yeah, of so course, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, um, if uh, as we start kind of winding down um, our conversation today, um, another thing that I kind of wanted to bring up to you, and you know, some and sometimes when it comes to talking about death, I mean, it does it can make some people feel very um, uneasy. Obviously, I mean, mm. uh, but it's just. The, the the fact of the matter is, is that death is going to come for all of us eventually yeah. at one point. You know, that is just that is one of the few certainties uh, in this world is that um, our days are numbered and the count and the clock is ticking as we speak. And eventually we're all going to, you know, find death at some point, mm -hmm. hopefully many, many, many years uh, down the road. Um, but I also kind of feel like um, I, I always one of the most influential i guess phrases in my life is simply just memento mori you know and just remember that we will die and i feel like that's like how we can actually truly appreciate the life that we have and live it to the fullest so mm. i guess it's just um how has you studying death to the depth uh, to the depth that you have just really kind of made you uh, have a different outlook um on life maybe a greater appreciation uh, for it and i don't want to put words in your mouth but what are kind of sort of your uh, thoughts uh, around that yeah, it really has. And I think it has shown how precious life can be and how lucky we are now living in the world we live in. Because, I mean, 19th century death was rife. You know, babies were dying. People were dying of really horrific diseases. People were dying in industrial accidents. There was no health and safety regulation back then. And um, so even looking at it from that side, um, you really do appreciate the life that you have and you appreciate the fact that it's very, very precious as well. And again, that phrase memento mori really, really does sum it up. It really, really does. And they say that, you know, the Victorians were a little bit obsessed with death because they, they talked about it so much and focused on it so much. But I think they also had a point as well because they were saying, look, this is something that's obviously came for them a lot younger and was probably a lot more prevalent. Um, but they were saying, look, death comes for us all. So we're just going to talk about it and be aware of it and make sure that we live the life we can to the fullest until that point. And I think if you just consider that every day in your life, you know, you wake up and you're happy to be here and you're still here. then I think it's a good way to live by it. And definitely studying death has really helped me to um, to see that. And also to find that actually people do get upset about it. But when you start to really break down the barriers and when you start to talk about it on a level that is comfortable for some people, um, that people will open up and talk about it, especially if you use a gateway topic as well, like archaeology or, you know, history or that sort of thing. People do really 
they do want to talk about it, but they don't quite know how to. And I think sometimes as well, they're reluctant to talk about it because they don't want to upset anybody else, which is a big thing. I think when you find that you start to talk to people a lot more, that they become more comfortable with you and they can talk about it. Because even at the cemetery, I have some people who are, you know, discussing things and they're like, oh, I shouldn't say that, you know, it sounds terrible. But when I say that they were buried and did this and I say it doesn't sound terrible because that's what happened. And it's not morbid because we're talking. I talk about it every day, but they feel like they're they're kind of putting a downer on me and I work in a cemetery, you know, so which which is so, so interesting. But yeah, I would definitely say it's given me an outlook on life that life is very precious and that we should try and appreciate as much as we can. Absolutely. So kind of going along with that, um, one of the things that I like to ask my guests to do um, as we get towards uh, the end of the show is to issue a challenge uh, to our listeners and our viewers, uh, you know, because it's like we may talk, we, we talk about like uh, all these things uh, in the podcast, but um, as I always say that um, information, stories, things like that can really only uh, take our viewers and our listeners uh, so far. If they want to do amazing things with the life that they have, they have to take action uh, themselves mm-hmm. to go out there and do amazing things. So with that, what challenge would you issue to our listeners and viewers today for them to go out there and start living a more adventurous life? Oh, to go and live a more. I would say go to somewhere that's outside your comfort zone and that could be death related. So I would say try and go to places like a cemetery, try and go to places like a medical museum, try and push yourself and go into these places that are so much surrounded by death but they will show you that there's so much fragility to life as well and I think it's something that will help you think about how how you want to live your own life that would be something I would suggest to viewers to, or to listeners to do okay great and and that's definitely a first uh, to come up uh, on the podcast Aoife that's that's a first suggestion for this question so right on <laughs> All right. So what I have for you next is my final three. These are three. I like to think that they're fun questions <laughs> that I ask okay. all my guests uh, at the end of the show <laughs> um, and a little bit different from what we've been talking about in this episode. But like I said, every uh, guest could ask these questions. And uh, the first of these three questions is what is your favorite place that you've been to so far? Ever. Ever. Oh, Did wow. I mention that these were loaded questions? <laughs> <laughs> Place I've ever been, well, I think my favorite city is probably Edinburgh. Mm. Um, I think that's probably, you know, evidently because of how beautiful it is and how gothic and, and spooky it is. And they have amazing medical museum, Surgeons Hall there. So that's probably one of my favorite places I've ever been. You know, speaking of Edinburgh, um, so... Yeah, l- like you, of course, I'm into spooky things. And anytime mm-hmm. I travel to a new city, one of the first things that I look into is whether or not that city has like at least one ghost tour that I could take part in. Yep. And if they have one, I'm usually on it. And I will say that to this day, um, the ghost tour that I did in Edinburgh is by far the scariest one that I have taken anywhere. It was the called the City of the Dead uh, Ghost Tours. And they were phenomenal. And that was actually yeah. a really, really scary uh, tour. So I do, so I can resonate with that answer. I do like that city as well. It is yeah. really great. Did you go to the uh, Frankenstein bar by chance while you were there? I did. I did, of course. <laughs> and I saw Frankenstein come out of the ceiling. Yeah, it was, it was quite an experience. I definitely recommend anybody who goes to Edinburgh to go to the Frankenstein bar because it's, it's a staple, really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it was kind of funny. Like I found that uh, just by happenstance because um, I was actually just hungry, and then I just uh, found uh, Nando's on on Google Maps, and I'm like, okay, we'll go to Nando's and uh, and get some food. And then lo and behold, there was the Frankenstein bar just yep. right across the street. So I'm like, okay, there <laughs> yeah. we go. All right, th- there's our next stop. <laughs> yeah, and I mean the Greyfriars Kirkyard is just the spookiest of cemeteries. It's stunning. And um, yeah, it's just it's just a magical place, I think, really. Right on. So um, and that's that's definitely a first uh, to come up on the podcast. So so okay, far we are wow. we are one for one for original wow. answers uh, to these questions. <laughs> I do but like I got, a challenge. <laughs> but I got a couple more for you. And uh, okay. the, the, the second question, and this one will be uh, kind of fitting uh, to what we've discussed today. And it is, uh, what is one thing on your bucket list that you have yet to do? 
one thing on my bucket list I have yet to do. Oh, that's a really good one. I'm trying to think traveling more would probably be a huge, huge up there. I would really love to go to New Orleans. That's high up as well, obviously. Spooky, memento mori type style. You've got the cemetery, you know. Um, I'd love to go to um, Salem as well. I'm really, really interested in the history of the witch trials. I think that would be great. So they're definitely on my bucket list of things to places to visit. In terms of things, other things to do, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. Um, that's something I'll have to think about. I'd have to think about that for for a longer, a longer time. But yeah, for traveling, um, places I really want to see would be New Orleans and Salem. Okay. Um, well, do not, and I repeat, do not come to New Orleans during the summer months. Don't do it. The don't, heat, yeah. Don't don't do it. Okay. <laughs> thank me. Thank me later. Go during the fall or during the winter. Thank me later. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I made the mistake of meeting my younger brother. Um, I was living in Florida at the time, and my younger brother and I we met uh, in New Orleans uh, for the Fourth of July weekend, and that was a terrible, terrible idea because <laughs> it was just so hot, and a lot of like the cafes, like uh, Cafe Dumont, is uh, yeah. is outside in an open. It's an oh, open so air you're cafe. Sitting in the heat, yeah. It no, was I'll... it was awful. So um, yeah, uh, say, save that for the fall of the winter. <laughs> No, my ghostly Irish skin just could not cope. <laughs> it definitely would not be, not be able to cope. But actually, now that I've thought about it a little bit, one big thing on my bucket list would be to publish a book. Mm. I think, actually, that would be one big thing. There's a few things I'd like to think about um, to do, but that's actually one thing I would really like to do would be to um, eventually publish a book of some sort. Do you, do you think maybe like nonfiction or would you write a fictional tale? So um, both, actually, I think there's both. I still, I have, you know, I do like to write. I have a blog where I do um, death related stuff. Um, so I think either or, to be honest, I have a few things floating around in my head. Um, but yeah, that definitely would be a big, um, a big bucket list thing for me and something I w would really like to achieve, actually. All right. Outstanding. And um, I, w I think New Orleans and Salem might be first to come up for this question. The book thing, unfortunately, someone had already answered that before. So I'll still give you two for <laughs> two for original answers since you led okay, with uh, cool. going to New Orleans and, uh, and Salem. <laughs> so there we go. And I got one more question for you in this final three. And this is a two parter. And okay. it is, what is your favorite animal? And have you seen this animal in the wild? What is my favorite animal? Actually, one of my favorite animals is a giraffe. Um, and I haven't seen them in the wild, but I have seen them in the zoo. Um, and I would I would obviously love to see them, you know, out in their own habitat. But I just remember I went to view them. Um, there's a place called Photo Wildlife Park in um, Foe Island in Cork in Ireland. And I went last year for my birthday. My husband brought me. Um, and I remember just watching the giraffes and just thinking they just don't look real because they're so unusual looking. Like I said, like, I was like, they look like animatronics, like they don't look, which sounds really silly. I know, but they just they just look so beautiful and un unusual to me. Um, but they're definitely one of my favorites for sure. Um, I really liked watching them eat the trees with their tongue and stuff. I thought that was pretty cool. But um, yeah. <laughs> all, all right. You, you know. I feel like that also might be a first. I feel like if someone had answered giraffes already, I would probably remember that because you're absolutely right. There are no other animals like giraffes out oh, there. I so, mean, they're, they're yeah. just giraffes. And so, so, I th so I'll give it to you since I can't think of anyone. So there, <laughs> there we go. We are three for three for, <laughs> for original answers uh, there, Aoife. So awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, Eva, uh, that's it. Uh, that's all the questions that I have for you today. But before we call it a day here, um, how can our listeners and viewers uh, connect with you? You know, you're out there um, on social media. Like you mentioned, you also got a blog uh, out there uh, as mm -hmm. well. So how can our listeners and viewers uh, reach out and connect with you? So I'm on X, formerly known as Twitter. So if you, uh, Eva Sutton Butler. I knew that name at, wasn't going to stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At Path Bodies. Um, P A T H B O D I E S, and I'm Pathological Bodies Project on Instagram. Um, also Eva Sutton Butler. You'll see my name pop up when you type that in. I've just started to do some TikToks as well. 
um, which is Spooky Lady Death. But if you um, want to know where all my stuff is and uh, where you can see and contact me, just go on to my blog, which is Pathological Bodies Project blog. So if you just go on to that, you'll be able to find um, all the information you can to reach me there. And um, yeah, please do reach out. Um, my email is there as well. Um, and you can drop me a DM on any social media. So I'd love to chat to anybody who is interested in this sort of thing. All right. And I'll have uh, everything linked up in the show notes uh, for this episode. Or if we have viewers uh, watching us talk on YouTube, it'll be down in uh, the description below. So they can find uh, all the links there to connect with you uh, that way just as well, too. All right. Well, uh, Aoife, I want to thank you very much uh, for taking the time uh, for joining me today. And, you know, I know I'm kind of catching you a little bit short notice here. You know, we just planned this a few days ago. Um, but, you know, okay. I, yeah, but I really appreciate you being willing to jump on and, you know, share your expertise uh, with us um, because, you know, I, I like to try to keep uh, the month of Halloween since it's my favorite holiday spooky theme. So I uh, appreciate you uh, being here today and sharing your insights with myself and the listeners to uh, fit the occasion. You know, this has been great. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. All right. Right on.